it's my uh, deep pleasure to introduce Alexandra Worden, who's a professor in GMR in Kiel, and also she holds her position at Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And her research focuses on the physiology and ecology of phytoplankton and the role of phytoplankton in the carbon cycle. And she's going to talk today about going where the wild things are, understanding microbial interactions in the sea. So please. Thank you. Okay, um, I just want to say it's, it's such an honor and wonderful pleasure to be here to celebrate Penny's inspirational research that's really changed the way so many people think about the oceans. So I want to thank you for inviting me here today. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Today I want to talk to you about our efforts, really inspired by Penny's work, to go back to the ocean and work there. And I won't talk about the, the love of my life, other than my husband, um, the picoeukaryote phytoplankton, which is what most of my so far career has been on. But I'm going to talk to you about trying to explore interactions in real time. Now, if we were to take seawater and filter it down uh, and look under the microscope, we'd see something like this. So here you have a unicellular predator, and you have some diatoms here, and then uh, there's some Prochlorococcus here and other bacteria. And what this image misses, and what every microscope misses for the most part, is that this is first, it's a three-dimensional space, not a two-dimensional space. And it misses time, the fourth dimension. So in every moment, these organisms are no longer adjacent to that member of the community. They're adjacent to some other member. So the, the possibilities for exchanges and encounters are, are remarkable and are something that are very hard to capture by most of our traditional sampling methods. I want to start, though, by just reflecting for a moment on um, Penny receiving this prize and speaking just a moment about the little bit I've been able to learn about Holger and Anna, Anna Greta Crawford. So in the 1950s, I think it is well accepted that the general medical field felt there was no man-made device that could ever replace the function of kidneys over the long term. And Holger Crawford, as you heard, coming from this very different background of a degree in economics and then packaging um, industry largely around dairy, um, in his mid-career went off and said, we can make this happen. And he paired in the 1960s with, with Alva to form a company that revolutionized dialysis availability and sustainability. I mean, so remarkable for so many people on the planet. And again, by, by not being bound by what his background was or what everyone else was saying at the time. Now, I was a wee baby at the time, but I would guess in the 1970s, there are a good number of people who would have told you that all photosynthetic life in the sea is known. Probably, right? And then there's Penny comes along and she says, well, let's take this crazy instrument out on the ocean, this bl human blood cell analyzer, and, and look around out there, and she discovers the most abundant photosynthetic entity on Earth. And so I think this is um, a connection that, that is uh, so exciting to have individuals in the world that, that just do these things. Um, I want to say also, though, that I think Penny's work has really changed the way we approach the ocean in that she recognizes always in her work the need to go back to the field. And we heard about that um, in her talk this morning, that we can study these things in culture and the cell biology is incredibly important. Knowing the function of each gene is incredibly important. But unless you iterate back to the field with that knowledge in hand, you never really understand the ecosystem. And so I think that's another major contribution in the number of labs that have somehow interacted with her and moved on in the world to embracing that idea. And it's hard to keep it all going, the in the lab stuff and the at sea stuff. So let's look at what it looks like. The work environment actually is a challenge. Now, this is the North Atlantic, but it's on a beautiful, calm day. This is Brian Binder, a former postdoc of Penny's, running a flow cytometer at sea. 
And again, anyone who's been out in the North Atlantic will say, yes, beautiful and flat in this image. And yet you can see that as you try to work and focus these instruments, um, it's, it's really different than in the lab. And you've effectively just moved your entire lab onto a rust bucket to try to pursue your science. Now, I um, was lucky enough to be able to buy a flow cytometer when I started my lab, and it also brings up all these questions you've never thought about. So here it is on a crane, this brand new $800,000 instrument, and I remember thinking, as a crane driver, had a lot of one hormone that I don't have as much of, and, and didn't really want to listen to my ideas on how sensitive the optics were to the crane line, but um, I remember wondering, so the, ins the university must be insured, but if it falls in the ocean, is university insurance going to cover it? Um, so let's look at what data looks like coming from this instrument. So on the x-axis here, you're looking at forward angle light scatter. It's a rough uh, indicator of cell size. And on the y-axis, you're looking at red fluorescence coming from chlorophyll. Here are these two, this is Gulf Stream water, the two Prochlorococcus populations in this water sample coexisting um, of Prochlorococcus and we have Synecococcus. And up here, you have these larger cells, so they're less abundant, but larger in cell size, so it can be quite important in terms of biomass. Um, and I want to remind us all that these are eukaryotic cells, and some of these, which are all doing photosynthesis, as we can tell from the red fluorescence coming from chlorophyll, they also eat other microbes. Okay, so they're different than Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus in that they have a very different evolutionary history. Phagocytosis is fundamental to eukaryotic uh, evolutionary history, the, the power to engulf another cell and ingest it. Um, and, and in the case of these guys, they engulfed another cell and held onto it as an endosymbiont in a series of different events. Um, so these are photosynthetic eukaryotes. Now, I'm just going to remind myself that I tend to use these terms interchangeably, so protists and unicellular eukaryote, and sometimes phytoplankton and algae, so I apologize in advance, but I'm going to be talking about that mix of names. Okay, so what does it look like when I say they're incredibly diverse? So these are the eukaryotic supergroups, and here are the rhizaria. So these are the guys that Ernst Haeckel liked to draw. And these, the, these rhizaria have marine members that are photosynthetic, that perform photosynthesis. Then there are the alveolates. These include the dinoflagellates that cause red tide blooms. There are the stromatopiles, where diatoms reside, of course, very important for fisheries food chains. There are the haptophytes, which you may have seen from space. They have this special coccolis that can be detected from space. And then the organisms that I focus on most, this is Micromonas, it's a presinophyte, a green alga um, um, th that was produced by that in this primary endosymbiosis event, whereas these other groups were produced when some other eukaryote engulfed the eukaryote that was already photosynthetic. Now, each of these groups are as divergent from each other as they are from us, represented over here by this whale. So really, we're talking about massive diversity of these organisms. And of course, some are going to be photosynthetic, and some are going to be heterotrophic predators or osmotrophs or many other things. Okay, so they're highly diverse protists and algae in the oceans. Some of them are morphologically similar, so that makes them difficult to study out in the field. Many of them are uncultured, um, and if they're uncultured, knowledge of physiology is typically quite weak. Uh, we're still discovering new photosynthetic lineages, which is shocking to me, but I guess I should have figured if Penny was discovering them. In the 80s, there would be more to come, and the distributions are poorly known. So that's not a good state of affairs given the conditions that we impose on our ocean today. So I think in our field, there's really this tremendous sense of urgency. What you're looking at here is chlorophyll detected from space. And although this is incredibly beautiful and you see these patterns as we move seasonally through time, you can see the greening on land, it gives this false idea. Of course, we're only looking at the surface of the ocean, but also each of these blooms and events could be a different alga. Now, so it would be fine if we lived in a steady state to not worry too much about it and just stay at the level, level of chlorophyll. But we know the oceans are changing, physical structure is changing, that changes nutrient availability, but it also changes interactions. 
different organisms have all different kinds of optima. And so the interactions that are occurring are different, and the members that perform each of these different blooms, etc., are also different. So again, as we push our planet and ask for adaptation fast, um, what do we select for and, and how will it look in the future? It's not a steady state, and so we really can't say how it will look. So if we get out into the field, this is kind of the idea of marine systems. So you have our photosynthesis, our primary producers over here, and Penny talked to us yesterday about material being exported to the deep. Um, we have these heterotrophic protists that are responsible for consuming these guys and uh, consuming bacteria as well. Um, we have the zooplankton and then the part that humans like to think about up here. So we've talked some, of course, about the peak of phytoplankton. Here you have pro and sin. Um, not done just for this talk, but because that's what you would do. Um, and, and then again, the consumers that, that most of uh, humankind uh, focuses on. And today I'd like to focus in on the heterotrophic protists because they're actually fragile and hard to study and to see in the sea and to understand who they're eating is a, is a big frontier for us. I'm going to also talk to you about mixotrophs, in this case predatory mixotrophs, so again these algae that are able to phagocytose other cells. Because you can imagine, we place them over here in this box right now, but if they're primarily doing predation they belong in this box here. And that means they're respiring CO2, not taking it out of the atmosphere. So as you model ecosystems you really better know where your mixotroph is in terms of its life stage or behavior in that moment. And then because Penny brought it up, I squeezed in a little bit on marine snow. Um, so I hope I don't have to go at New York high speed to get through that. Okay, so the nature and interactions and the players involved can really be mysterious in the field. Here's a diatom, and these are bacterial cells. So we know who the diatom in is, but we don't know who the bacteria are, and this is in natural seawater. And here's a mesocosm study where we use labeled bacteria, and this is natural synecococcus. And here's a protus, you can see its nucleus, its food vacuole. So we can say that this protus ate these cells, but we can't say who the protus is. So we're not able to make those food chain connections that we really need to know, again, to be able to model these systems and look at future trajectories. Now I mentioned that there are these predatory phytoplankton, so here's your eukaryotic photoautotroph, and here's your mixotroph. So this is a photosynthetic cell that's augmenting its nutrition by phagotrophy. So you can ask, is it eating to get carbon? Well, it can do photosynthesis, so we might think, well, if it can do photosynthesis, why would it bother eating to get carbon? And so another idea is that they might be eating to get nutrients. For prey cells, we see a lot of these organisms in places where we see a lot of Prochlorococcus. So that's a terrible environment to be a eukaryote trying to compete with Prochlorococcus because your surface area to volume ratios garbage next to Prochlorococcus. So you just can't compete for the inorganic nutrients. So why not eat Prochlorococcus to get your nutrients? That seems much smarter. <laughs> so how, and, and again, key as we think towards future oceans and we think towards the biosphere that we know and love so well, we really need to know how much these organisms are contributing to primary production versus respiration. And I want to remind us all that there are many lineages that have now arisen that are purely phagotrophic, but arose, they're not the original phagotrophs, they're guys who were photosynthetic and, and then got rid of photosynthesis. I have no idea why you'd do that. But anyway, they've gotten rid of it. And so evolutionarily, sequence-wise, they look quite similar to a lot of these algae or mixotrophs, and, and, you, and it's hard to parse out from sequence. So that brings us to this problem that they're difficult to work with under the microscope, and sequences or evolutionary relationships often don't reveal their ecosystem roles or activities. So what, it's difficult to tell from something like the 18S ribosomal RNA gene whether something is a photoautotroph, a predatory mixotroph, or a pure phagotroph, unless you have it in culture, and, then if you, and, and we know that most of these marine guys are not in culture. So there are some approaches to this problem. You could use single cell sorting, flow cytometry, um, for cells that you've stained a food vacuole, or you're gonna say it needs a stained food vacuole and acid of chlorophyll, then it would be a mixotroph. 
You could do incubations, uh, which is what we've been doing. Well, we've been doing both with 13C and 15N labeled prey. So we use Prochlorococcus and we do use our, our favorite organisms too. So Penny, we're not trying to be mean to pro, we do it to both of them. Um, to then use stable, R stable isotope probing to pull out the heavy DNA, which will tell us that organism ate those cells and has this heavier DNA, and, and you can see that integration. And I'm going to talk briefly now about an in-lab model system where we've sequenced the genome, done lots of experiments in physiology and RNA-seq. I'm not going to talk to you about all that data today, but I want to just talk to you about the physiological data. So here you're looking at Ochromonas. This is in that stromatopile part of the tree related to diatoms, but this is an organism that can eat, unlike um, diatoms. And here you see it in the light with no prey, and here you see it in the dark with, with prey and in the light with prey. So you can tell that for this guy, under these conditions, it loves light and prey. That's its sort of optimal. We don't know what conditions might shift one way or the other, but it does pretty well in the dark with prey, with no light at all. This is acclimated over many generations. So this is a guy that doesn't need light per se. It can operate as a heterotrophic predator, but we keep them over in that box of primary producers in our global models. So we have to keep that in mind. Now we can go over here to this other species, and what we see here is that this guy, uh, if you don't give it prey and you only give it light, it won't grow at all. And if you put it in the dark and don't give it light, but you do give it prey, it won't grow at all. And, but if you have it with light and um, prey, it's quite happy. So this guy requires light and prey. It cannot live by photosynthesis alone. So this is where we get into this, this idea in oceanography. We love to have averages, big chlorophyll measurements of the whole ocean. It's, they're powerful and important, but the details of the cell biology really matter if you want to get predictive. Okay, now if we go out in the field, here's the problem. So it turns out all of these clades, these are related, uh, this is a subgroup within the stromatopiles, um, these are all uncultured guys, and here's our Ochromonas, and then we have a couple other uncultured groups. And so if we go out to bats, which Penny showed us a little data from, what we'll see, so this is Amplicon data, and what you're looking at in columns is the relative abundance of different groups of this organism, or these different organisms. And so you can see here's some, a clade that's really important at bats, and here's another clade, and sometimes we see variations that relate to whether it's the stratified period at bats or the deep mixing period at bats. Like, for example, this guy, when their nutrients are higher, this guy is much more present. It can't really hack it in the stratified period when pro is so happy. Now here's our cultured model, and what you'll see is there's no sequence at all from this guy, although it was isolated from the ocean. So that's a bit disappointing. And if we go out into the Pacific, where it actually was isolated, um, we, we also don't see any of this guy. And so these are other samples, mesotrophic and oligotrophic, where you see these different patterns. So this is where we really need those SIP experiments, where we feed them this labeled prey, and that's what we've done. And so this group loves to eat Prochlorococcus. Now we haven't tested lots of other prey other than the Pico eukaryotes, but here's a group now we have no cultured representative whatsoever, so we can't learn a lot more about its physiology right now, but it's clearly really important in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. Okay, so that brings us to a perfect place. Often genomes can inform us something about an organism so that maybe we could chase it and bring it into culture. And so a perfect place then to do cell sorting at sea. So the idea that you'll pass these cells by the laser and separate them out based on some characteristic that you care about. So we're going to separate and capture healthy photosynthetic or stained unicellular eukaryotes of interest and then do genome sequencing. And this is particularly important because eukaryotic genomes are so big that the idea that you can go to metagenomic information and try to assemble them is, doesn't really work out too well. And we don't have a lot of reference genomes to help us do that. Okay, and so this approach has been really powerful. Um, it's something we've used a lot to look at evolution and diversity of different groups. And our most recent one that I won't talk to you about uh, is, is on this mixotroph and the, the genome information that we've been able to recover from it. But what I want to talk to you about for the rest of my talk 
is this possibility to analyze cells along with co-associated entities as a cohesive unit. And so this is really important because we've been talking about interactions and how do you identify interactions of one uncultured organism with another uncultured organism. So if we go out and sort a cell, it could represent a couple different types of interactions between uncultured guys. So here's this protist that I showed you. And so we could end up, if we see bacteria when we sequence, sort a single cell in sequence, we could say, well, that's probably prey that were in their gut, right? And that's going to be dependent on the frequency and encounter rate of that predator-prey interaction. Is it a bacterium that's super common? Does it make sense that this would be something we're seeing commonly in the food vacuole? So if we got Prochlorococcus in here, we'd probably guess, yeah, probably prey. We wouldn't immediately go to pathogen or endosymbiont, or, although maybe we should think outside the box. But anyway, um, it could be a detrital lifestyle that we're seeing of a bacterium sitting on a coanoflagellate, in this case it's a coanoflagellate that we've depicted, um, where maybe that cell is a little less healthy than we saw it, thought, and so it's actually colonized, and that's the interaction we're seeing. Or it could be an ephemeral interaction just due to the physics of seawater and small particles. Uh, in this case, this is Eros. It's a gene that uh, Nicole King Labs lab discovered, which triggers sex in these organisms. So, and it happens through some kind of ephemeral interaction between a bacterium and um, a unicellular eukaryote. Okay, and again, key here is that classical metagenomic methods cannot identify physically co-associated units, so we have to use different approaches. So let's go out um, into the, the North Pacific and see what we can find. So we're going to focus now on wild, purely uh, heterotrophic predators. We're not, we're going to exclude chlorophyll. So this is what that looks like. So here's forward angle light scatter again, indicator of cell size, and in this case, we've stained for the food vacuole. And you can see this group of cells here. We made them bigger so you can see it. But yes, they really are a population. Um, and if you go over here and look at chlorophyll fluorescence, um, here these cells are actually really truly off scale. We've just cranked the electronics because we like to see everything we're working with. And this is a sample from closer to shore where you see Synecococcus and photosynthetic eukaryotes. And now we've crossed these guys out. We say we don't want anything that has chlorophyll. And what we get, all the blue dots here are uncultured coanoflagellates. So this is by 18S RNA sequencing, 99% of the cells. And then we had this one alveolate and, and one uh, or two alveolates and a parasite type and a rosarian. Um, so if we go from here, I just want to stop and tell you a little bit about coanoflagellates since that's what we've recovered here. So coanoflagellates are the closest living unicellular relatives of metazoans, so you and me. And um, they're amazing because they have a unicellular form and yet they also have a truly multicellular form, not colonial, but a multicellular form where they build bridges. And so, for example, the King Lab um, is funded by Howard Hughes because these organisms can tell us a lot about the origins of multicellular life in the medical realm. Okay. And we feel like we have mounting evidence that they're important marine predators. So again, we get these organisms a lot when we do our food vacuole-based sorting. So they're actively feeding because these organisms can have a food vacuole or not, and we're, we're getting an active vacuole. Um, and when we do our RNA-stable isotope probing experiments, we also see that they're eating Prochlorococcus, although they're called bacteria, you know, it's thought they eat um, heterotrophic bacteria, but no reason not to eat uh, Prochlorococcus. So, unless pennies are around. Um, anyway, so, uh, so we see that these organisms are out there eating in the ocean. Okay, so let's go ahead and then sequence some of these wells. So we're going to sequence a single well here. And so we're going to look at the inner world of the coanoflagellate, or maybe it's cells on the outside, who knows. So it's single cell sorting at sea, whole genome amplification, sequencing, genome assembly, and then various binning efforts. So what we have here is by Costa Minor, it was 98% of the wells. We had a 1% that was other coanos. And it's an uncultured coanoflagellate. So, um, so that's pretty neat. And we were able to get quite a lot of its genome assembled. Um, 
gene modeling is a different issue I won't talk about. And then in this same single well, we had this divergent gamma proteobacterium in the same wells, and from each well we could recover a complete genome. So as Penny mentioned, this is really tricky with a single bacterium. Um, because normally when you do this whole genome amplification, there are some biases where you don't recover all the material, and in this case, we're able to get complete genomes. Um, and so here's what this, so that implies that there was more than one of this bacterium in the well. Here it is in a phylogenetic tree, and if you know anything about this group, there's quite a few uh, pathogens that reside in here. So legion Legionella is, um, causes Legionnaires' disease, et cetera. But there's this huge group of uncultivated marine sequences amongst all these quite well-known characters. Um, and what we find, though, is that when we go back to, to although we found this in 25% of our sorts, when we go to the raw seawater, uh, it it's, would be screened out of Amplicon data because it's so low in abundance. So that makes us start to think it's some kind of specific association um, because we see it in a lot of these sorts, uh, but not in the rare, in the, in the bulk seawater. So we don't think it's a food item. It just doesn't make sense. The encounter rate wouldn't work. It has a reduced genome of about one megabase pair. It's 97, in this well, it's 97 percent complete based on universal single copy genes. And it has a Legionella-like type 4 secretion system, which of course is used by pathogens and other organisms to exchange either um, DNA or protein. But very common, of course, in pathogenesis. And if we go and look at some of the pathways in this organism here, you're looking at the genes detected, the, the relative percent within a pathway. So you're going to go across here. These are, each are different parts, uh, different pathways. For instance, these ones are all related to amino acid metabolism. Here's tRNA biosynthesis and fatty acid biosynthesis. And here are two guys that we've sequenced. So these two, these organisms in yellow are known endosymbionts of um, actually the, of insects. Um, here you have a guy like E. coli that has an enormous genome and some quite a bit of redundancy, and you can see that it has all the pathway components that you would ever expect. And in this schema, Pelagibacter, SAR11, and Prochlorococcus both do pretty well in having a lot of genes um, in the pathway. But you can see these guys have just gotten rid of a lot. And that tells us that they're probably dependent on their host for, um, for these different amino acids and other really key factors for growth. So we think that what we have here then is interest, something that reflects intracellular growth because of the complete list, complete list completeness of the genomes, and that might be a pathogen. And so this would be a new angle for thinking about in microbial food webs if we need to think about some of the bacteria that we thought of as being prey as actually being pathogens to the predators that are supposed to consume them. And so for the most of the rest of my talk, I want to talk about a virus we found in these wells. So this is a distinct lineage of giant virus. So we'll hear another whole talk on viruses. Um, and I want to say that there are many viruses now known of phyto marine phytoplankton, and Karina is going to talk about that. And, um, and so I haven't represented those. As these are, of course, the host organisms. But what we found here is a virus over here infecting a coenoflagellate an uncultured coenoflagia. And now there's only one other marine virus known that infects um, a heterotrophic protus. And the protus it infects is in this very different part of the eukaryotic tree. Now it turns out that these viruses are giants, so they have genomes. These are uh, giant viruses, are viruses with genomes over 300 KB. Um, and you can see these are actually mostly marine giant viruses. There's about five known for phytoplankton and one for, uh, for this, this character over here, and then the rest are coming from land. This one infects a wasp. So we've got this brand new uh, realm of marine viruses to think about. And if we go look at this and compare it to other databases, again, these unknown proteins that Penny talked about that we really need to learn the function of, and many uh, that, that do associate with other viruses. So it has genes that many cellular organisms have, and this is one of the exciting things about the giant viruses. Genes that were thought, functions that were thought to be unique to cellular life are present in these organisms. 
Um, and for us, one of the most interesting things was that it has three putative microbial rhodopsins. Now, rhodopsins, of course, can be um, ion pumps or proton pumps, and there's, it, in the marine bacteria, it's been shown that they have these rhodopsins, and they're able to augment growth during periods of starvation, a heterotrophic bacterium, if you have it in the light. Um, so, so this has been a really huge discovery, of course, in marine microbiology by... Um, uh, Ed DeLong and Oded Beja and many others have contributed to that story. So if we look at it phylogenetically, though, here are some of these marine ones um, that have been, some of them have characterized functions now. And you see that these viral ones are really divergent. So what does that mean in terms of function? And in fact, we're calling them viral, but they all have unknown hosts. This is all metagenomic data, except now the quantiviruses and one other genome sequence virus that infects an alga. So they're not recent host to virus transfers. If you look at this tree and if you compare to rhodopsins, for example, that exist in some epistocons, they're not related to those. Um, they're divergent, and you can ask, are they functional? So we've been really lucky to work with a Japanese group where we were able to get the crystal structure and they were able to also to express it in E. coli and shows that it acts as a light-driven proton pump. So it's tremendously exciting that this virus of a, um, of a predatory heterotrophic eukaryote is bringing in this light-driven proton pump. Now you could ask then, it, all ro these rhodopsins need a chromophore, so retinol, and retinol is produced by the cleavage of beta carotene, and you could ask what the source is then for that because the coenoflagellate does not encode this pathway. For the algal virus, it's easy to imagine. Here are the enzymes, and here, if you look in the host of the alga, you see all those genes, and the virus then doesn't bother to have them. In quantiflagellates, just the first two steps that are shared with sterile biosynthesis are present. And actually, it's the virus that's then bringing all the other parts of this pathway to also make the chromophore that goes along with that rhodopsin. So it's very exciting. It's not just bringing this one last piece of the puzzle, but it brings with it all the machinery that's needed for the chromophore. And then we can go out in the field and look at expression. So the virus itself encodes the entire rhodopsin photosystem. Um, the pigment and the, and the cleavage enzyme. And if we go out in the field, we can look at the relative frequencies. In black, you're looking at a marker for giant viruses, and in pink, you're looking at VRR. And the bottom line is that um, there's a pretty good relationship between these, which might imply that many of the giant viruses carry this gene. Um, and it's curious to think that these rhodopsins have so far not been seen in marine phage, although photosystem proteins have been seen in cyanophage. Of course, pho oxygenic photosynthesis is being very different than phototrophy. Um, but they're also not seen in small eukaryotic viruses. And if we go out and look at amino acid differences in these that have f very large functional implications, we see that this one we've characterized is the most abundant. This is terametagenome assemblies. Um, and we can look uh, at, this is out in Hawaii, looking uh, at through depths, and we can see, again, this is a very prominent one, and that they're absent at depths, which makes sense. Um, but it looks like there's a plethora of other types of rhodopsins, other motifs that await discovery, and, and it's known that these slight differences in certain positions play a major role in what kind of rhodopsin you're working with. Okay, so we've moved then from these interactions we might typically think about, and we have now what we think is a pathogen and a heterotrophic unicellular host, and we have a virus in its host. And so just really exciting to be, uh, of course, now trying to chase these guys and bring them into the lab so we might understand them better, um, but to, to really start to identify some connections we didn't know about. Um, and so it's, a, in our mind, kind of a new ecology for quantiflagellates in the wild, so they're one of the most active predators out there. We see this, you know, if you want to be controversial, transient, transient mutualism between virus and host. And the virus also has chitinase, for example, so ability to process and make more labely uh, and more available material for possible phototrophy. Um, we have to ask ourselves about the role of pathogens and distributions and activities, and are coenoflagellates food for bacteria? Okay, and I just want to end now. This is Penny brought up marine snow. So I, I added this back, which is why I'm going to use some of my question time. But so with this importance of cells that move into the deep ocean, this is how 
we've been protecting our atmosphere um, for quite a long time. Now, Penny reminds us that this cell might at some point have a bunch of bacteria on it as it moves down through the water column. And so the question is, when it comes down into the sediments, which members of sediment communities are active? Which members are poised to respond to some algae raining down or to other organisms and detritus? Because they brought with them this consortia from the surface ocean. And you like probably, well, if you're American, you definitely stick cheese in the refrigerator. And you do that because it will last a lot longer. So we've now refrigerated all of these surface ocean bacteria down at four degrees and pretty high pressure. So when we go in and sequence in these environments, are we looking at the active important members or are we looking at some residual population that's well preserved in the sediments? So we went out to explore that, and this is work, again, with 13C labeled detrital algal material, and this is... Um, this was developed right after I had kids, and so my brain did not work for writing, but it could work for tinkering around with instruments. And what we said was, let's take a sediment core, normal coring device, and put on this very simplistic mechanical pump in which we'll have put this 13C labeled algae that we can now pump into the sediment and in situ without taking it back to the surface where things might pop up and get active again or whatever it is, which is how these incub incubations are normally done. We'll incubate it down in the deep sea and see what we can learn about the activity that occurred as this thing sits on the seafloor after we've pumped in this substrate. Okay, so we've pumped in this substrate and the first thing you're going to look for is that transfer of 13C organic matter into 13C dissolved inorganic carbon. That will tell us that this material has been used and respired. And when we look down core, this is inches, centimeters into the core, you can see the delta in DIC, you can see this is where the bulk of, this is where we injected, and this is where we see this big um, uh, introduction of uh, delta in the DIC. So the organisms have respired, used and respired this material, and this is a second tracer of heavy water we had in the solution. Now when we go in and sequence these samples, we can see all these bacteria DDs and delta bacteria. But when we use DNA SIP here, what we see is actually it's these very rare guys that have picked up the, the, um, the 13C, so the DNA that we could separate out. So again, telling us that these rare players, the guys who would have said you could probably ignore when you go around looking at deep sea samples, um, actually have incorporated this 13C, and they did it within four days, which if you think about how people talk about deep sea, everything is really slow, but these have managed to use it within four days. So maybe some things to think about there. And I didn't point this out in the video, but these are actually whale bones. So in this case, we're working at a site that had once had a really big input of organic material, and we're looking at the, the twilight period of that uh, these bones here, and then we work on and off the whale to see if those communities are poised differently. So with that, I just want to say, um, of course, this is a system that's really important for nature, but also for humankind. Um, we've talked about these different groups, and I think it's so key that we really do understand cell biology. Um, but it's also really important that we understand activities and interactions in the field. And so today we've looked at potential pathogens of protists and some new viruses that might uh, help or might control these populations. I like to think they're trying to kill these guys to save these guys, but that's... <laughs> Maybe it's all peace and love, I don't know. Um, and then, of course, really trying to understand what happens in the deep sea. With that, I want to thank my group, uh, who are wonderful and make this all really fun. I've tried to acknowledge the right people on the right slides. And, of course, I want to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Um, we will take time for a few questions. Don. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh here we go. Yeah, thanks. That was a great talk. I'm curious about these, these, these pathogens. Is there any possibility they could be um, endosymbiotic instead? Absolutely, and that's why we'd like to bring it into culture. The, the only reason we think that might not be the case is we don't... You know, it's not the majority of the coanos that have them, so if it were some kind of endosymbion, it's a transient one. 
Um, and then you might expect to find more of it in the seawater. I don't know. So that's why we're leaning on pathogen. But of course, there's a lot of real biology to be done if we can bring it into culture. More questions? Kirsten. I'm curious to know if these relationships, are they very old? Can you trace the phylogeny of the viruses and the bacteria that are related to the hetero, uh, what you call them? Yeah, these the predatory protists. Yeah. yeah. Can you trace them back in time and see if they are really old and original? Well, so for each, you can do that at a genomic level, and from that we know that this lineage of viruses is is different than, I mean, it's related to, but different than other giant viruses. So there's a core set of genes that all of these giant viruses have, and many of which are shared with smaller viruses, um, but of course there's a bigger core for the giant viruses. And so, um, and, you know, but at some point these viruses diverged into different hosts. And so what you see for something like the rhodopsin is that it seems to have been a very ancient um, horizontal or host to, to virus transfer because the ones in algae and the ones in all the metagenomes and the ones in the coano uh, actually all have a, a what appears to be a common origin unless until we go, of course, if your taxonomic sampling is too low, it gets a little dangerous. In the case of the chitinase, we can see that's very clearly a, a semi-recent host-derived gene. It's, the gene is from other opisticons, um, and, and it's not found in that host, uh, or at least the genome sequence we have, and it's not found in, um, in the other quenoflagellates that have genome sequences that are cultured. Um, so, but it is opisticont-like. So we, and there's two other examples of viruses that have chitinase that's very different, and they all seem to be independent events from the other two, also clearly from host. So then, in a way, this is extreme examples of coevolution. And uh, is there also reason there to r really not discriminate between parasites uh, and uh, friends, if you want, if you like? I mean, they have co-evolved for so long times. So you can't really well. Think yeah, of them I mean, as what are you gonna? Yeah, I mean, we 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 put boxes and labels and, tr but yeah, it's uh, it's a challenge to know what the real and you know the thing is we look under one condition or we you know people work in the ocean often when it's kind of manageable to sample, and there are very different conditions where the whole set of relationships might change quite a lot. And something that was friendly over here is no longer friendly. This is the big thing with the mixotrophs. It's thought that temperature shifts them closer to being purely predatory. Um, and we talk about temperature increasing. Now, I don't think the data is really there to support that as a sort of global idea. But it's something to really think about. OK. In the back. Hello, yeah, I just have a quick one. You mentioned um, modeling of uh, bringing mixotrophy and these ideas back into these large global models. And so, you know, so in something like Darwin, we model mixotroph with, say, three parameters, right? And so I'm just wondering if you, so certainly these interactions are very important and there are, you know, millions of them. So I'm just wondering how do we think about going from the specific interactions and then upscaling to mass balance models when we care about biogeochemistry? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think you have to explore the, the sort of spectrum of possible outcomes. Um, do you mean like Darwin, like Mick? Yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, of course, Mick is on it, right? So um, we just need to put in there that spectrum of possibilities. And then I, I hope some of these models run through the, the different possible scenarios in a more complex um, ecosystem. And I, I have to say, I think this kind of approach is critical because we can never go out there and measure intera every interaction, but we could run through quite a few scenarios with a big computer, as long as we inform it correctly. Okay, thank you. We're going to have to end here. Let's give her a big round of applause.